Hi everyone, my name's Farah, and today I'm going to be talking about today's scientists and how science is more than just the lab today. So to start off, I guess we can start with the question, what does it mean to be a scientist? And since we have a small crowd, I'm actually going to ask you, what do you think a scientist is today? Anyone? Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So usually when I have a question and I don't know how to answer it, I Google it. Pretty straightforward. And I looked up the first three Google images for this particular question. So here we have a scientist. He's wearing a lab coat. He's clearly intensely involved. It looks like it's night, so maybe he's working long hours. And he's staring really intently at this yellow liquid. So clearly a passionate scientist. Another one that I found was a mad scientist. He looks like, I mean, I don't know what his intentions are. Maybe they're not that pure, but he does have a lab coat on and lab gloves. The goggles aren't on his head, but it's a two out of three on lab safety so far, so that's still pretty good. And then the third one that I found was a lab where you can see different students either working alone or in a group, and they're clearly involved on their project. Now, this was a simple Google search, but it sort of paints this picture that a scientist is someone who wears a lab coat, they're working long hours in the lab, and they're really driven by their science. And that seems to be sort of it. And that's sort of the idea that I actually had when I was wrapping up my high school back over in Saudi Arabia. Now, in my high school, we didn't actually have a careers course. So when it came to me thinking about my next steps, I sort of had to do it based on what I thought I was interested in. So when my dad announced that we would be immigrating to Canada, specifically Mississauga, I began to look at universities in the area. I thought that the University of Toronto Mississauga was a pretty convenient choice. And in terms of picking a program, well, I knew that I enjoyed the sciences, and I knew I enjoyed English. I liked writing. But I didn't seem to find a program that made them both work, but that was okay. I knew that I enjoyed science. I specifically liked biology. I liked learning about how genes work and how they made everything work in your body. So I decided to go with molecular biology as my program. I really wanted to learn how DNA worked in your body. So fortunately for me, my very first class was called molecular biology, and I began learning more about DNA. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And as you may have heard, it's found in every single cell in your body. It's a blueprint of life. It codes all of the different proteins. It codes things such as the color of your eyes, the shape of your nose, the way you walk, the way you talk, as well as nurturing aside, but genes also form the basis of that. And in my classes, I began to learn that DNA is made up of bases, specifically cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. And the way letters form words is the way bases form genes in your DNA. And these different genes in your DNA will code all the proteins that make you who you are. Now, the letters that, uh, that make up an alphabet are the same as the way uh, bases make up DNA. And it's actually interesting to note that 99% of your genetic code is actually similar with every one. It's a 0.1% it's a variation that makes you different and that makes you unique. So I was all deep in my courses and I really liked learning about genes. But at the same time, I still wanted to explore writing. I didn't just want to be involved in science. So I discovered my campus newspaper called The Medium on campus and I started writing. I first started off with news and arts articles, but I slowly found myself with features. What I really liked about the feature section was that I could speak to other people, interview them, and find out their backgrounds, like what drove them to do what they were doing today. And then as I was writing for my campus newspaper, I ran into one particular event. This event was talking about the research opportunity program on campus. And these, this was a panel of professors, and they were all discussing how as first years, we should get involved with research and we should apply and find something that excites us. So I ended up writing up my article, but the words that they said at the events kept coming back to me. They kept saying, get involved, participate. So I decided to take them at their word and I ended up applying to the research opt program. I picked five projects. So I picked two that involved genes because I really wanted to use what I was learning in class in a lab setting and see whether I was any good at this thing called research, and I also applied to three others. Now, this isn't one of those stories where everything goes right, so I applied to five projects, but I got a rejection. 
and another one, and another one, and another one. So by this point, that was four out of five rejections, and I wasn't sure. Like, I told myself, you know what, I'm a first year. I'm applying to second year projects. It's okay if I fail a few times. But fortunately, the fifth one actually did ask me for an interview. Coincidentally, it was actually the same professor in the panel here who asked me for an interview, so that was a nice coincidence. It was Dr. Sonia Hinnick for Log and Dr. Linda Cohn who began talking to me about this project involving bird window collisions. Now, this was all about ecology. I'm someone who doesn't really explore the outside, like I would prefer to sit at home, curl up with a book, maybe a nice TV show, and I don't really know much about birds. But as they started talking to me, they told me about bird window collisions and how it was an important problem. And I decided that, yes, this is something that I want to explore, and it's a chance for me to see what research is about. All the students on my campus were buzzing about this word research, and I just wanted to see what it really involved. So they ended up accepting me, and I accepted the project too, and I guess I got my first taste of research. Now, my first question when I started this project was, bird window collisions, like, why doesn't the bird realize that it's a barrier and simply fly away? I mean, it sounds like a really simple thing to do. So I decided to look into the studies to see what the explanation was behind this. So during the day, two different things can happen. Now, when you look into the mirror on a general day, you know it's a reflection. You know that there isn't another version of you right there in the mirror, right? But when a bird approaches a window, it may see a reflection of things like habitats or trees, forests, lakes, and it can't realize that this is a false reflection. So it flies on to the win into the window before realizing that it's a false reflection and unfortunately there's a collision first. Another effect that could happen is the fly-through effect. So glass windows may be completely transparent and the bird assumes that if it flies through, it can actually pass out of the other side. There's clearly nothing in the way, but again, the glass barrier is there. If it's a bird window collision during the night, it's actually because of light pollution. So I'm sure as you guys were driving here, you noticed there are street lights, cars have headlights, buildings emit light, and if you pass square one, I'm sure you noticed all of the lighting in the area. So this sort of light pollution, it causes birds to fly lower than they usually would, and that increases the risk of a bird window collision. So these are sort of the three explanations behind why bird window collisions can happen. And once I read that, I was like, okay, that makes sense. So bird window collisions, this is why they could happen. But how frequent are they really in Canada? So in Canada, about 25 million birds die annually due to bird window collisions. And this is in addition to normal bird deaths, such as predation by cats or habitat destruction. So this is pretty alarming in a way. And then I sort of wondered, what about the GTA? The GTA has Lake Ontario. There are quite a few lakeshore spaces and parks. So what's the number like for the GTA? And it's actually around one million specifically for bird window collisions with buildings. And then this whole project is based on the University of Toronto's Mississauga campus. This campus is home to over 140 birds during migrating seasons. It's based on 225 acres of land, it's right next to Arendelle Forest, and it's right next to the Credit Valley River. So with all this in mind, what my, project, my professors really wanted me to find out was, are bird window collisions a significant problem on the UTM campus? So I didn't actually have to explore the whole campus looking for dead birds, I was specifically looking at one specific building, the CCIT building. In case you haven't visited the campus, this building is located like right next to a green patch of forest. There is glass on both the north side and the south side. And my task was pretty simple. I had to survey the site twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. If I did unfortunately find a dead bird, I would photograph it and place it in a Ziploc bag, which by the way is the perfect size for a bird body bag. I also had to identify the species, gender, and age of the bird before placing it to be frozen in the freezer in case an ornithology student ever wanted to look at it. So this would happen during the summer of 2015, and during my project, I sort of became the go-to bird person. If anyone found a dead bird, I would be emailed or texted, and I would go and show up. And unfortunately, I did find a few dead birds. So this here is a hairy woodpecker. It's really beautiful. I identified it because it has a black and white wing pattern, which is pretty distinctive. This one is an adult, 
And I'm fairly certain this is a female because males usually have a red stripe under their eye. It's a little large. I think it's around five or six centimeters, but I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, definitely a very beautiful bird. Another one that I found was a black-capped chickadee. Now, these ones are distinctive because they have a black head and a black bib um, on their neck and white stripes on the side. This one is actually really small. Don't be fooled by the picture. It fits right in the cup of your palm. It's very tiny. So I kept collecting birds throughout the summer. I also found two American robins. These are fairly common. I'm sure you've seen them in your neighborhood. They have a reddish chest, and they're usually hopping around in parking lots or right in your backyard. And yeah, so this one is not moldy. It's just that it rained that morning, so it looks a little wet. And yeah, so towards the end of my project, I had collected all these dead birds. Now, fortunately and unfortunately, I had only collected about seven birds. It was good because I did not want to collect any more dead birds than I had to. But it was bad because this was my summer project and I really wanted data to show in the end. But that was okay because I actually found out that there was a reason there were fewer bird window collisions that year. So it turns out that the summer of 2015 was a colder, clearer spring. And when springs are clearer, it means that birds will actually fly above, higher, and they're less likely to, fall, to get into a bird window collision. So at the end of my project, I wrapped it up with a nice report, and I suggested that what we should do to be certain that bird window collisions aren't a significant problem on campus is to repeat this project for two more years. And this year, there is a fourth year student who is doing just that. I also had the chance to present my findings at a conference called the Ontario Biology Day Conference. So at the end of my project, I realized that Okay, I like research. I like having a question, and I like going ahead and systematically answering it. But I don't think that ecology is for me. I sort of, perhaps I was scarred by the dead birds. Perhaps I didn't want to see any more of that. So as I started my second year, I decided that I wanted to look for a research project that involved a lab setting, where I could be inside the lab and perhaps put a bit of what I was studying into practice. At this point, I actually got a promotion within the medium. I was a section editor at this point, so I got, to pay, I got paid to write and edit. So I kept writing. I wrote about things that were of interest to students, but at the same time, I also began to interview the people who I thought was interesting. So I kept finding professors or students who were involved with research and asking about their path. For example, Professor Sarah Hillward in, was studying youth identity in Kenya. There was a UTM graduate who had actually created a company based on insect farming and wanted to make insects a part of our daily, daily lives for lunch. So that was definitely interesting. Now, what I noticed was the common theme between these stories was that they all talked about science funding. They actually got paid to do research. Now, these were pretty established people, like they had gone through graduate school or they were professors or they had just graduated simply from university with an undergraduate degree. So. My question was, what about me? I'm simply a second year undergraduate student. Like, is there any chance that I could be paid to do research? So I looked around and I found that there was actually an agency that did this. So NSERC is actually a federal agency that funds basic science. And they offer something called an undergraduate student research award. So the idea here is that you get paid around $6,000 to do research. And for me, this was gold. Like, if I got paid to do what I liked, and I got paid for it, like, that would be awesome. There are a, there's a set of criteria with this award, and that's that you actually have to go out and find a professor who would be willing to apply for this award for you. So I took a look through my department, and I found that one of my professors who was actually teaching me a course at that time was also, he fulfilled the criteria. So I went ahead, and I applied with Dr. Tim J. Westwood. And fortunately, we were successful, and I did end up getting this research award, and so I was set to do research for a summer under the Westwood Lab. Now, the Westwood Lab uses fruit flies in their research. So I imagine you're thinking of the little fruit flies that buzz around perhaps the fruit in your kitchen. So they might be annoying to you, but they are incredible in research because they're not only small, they're also, they reproduce really fast. It can go from an embryo to larva, to pupa, to an adult in just 30 days. And you can easily manipulate their genes to create the mutations that you're interested in studying. So they're a really handy organism. But for Drosophila, or fruit flies, to go through all of these stages, they need the hormonic disome. 
Egdysone will trigger each developmental stage by activating egdysone inducible genes. Now, the Westwood lab in particular is interested in the heat shock factor. And a previous student in the lab had found that the heat shock factor bound to seven different places in the egdysone inducible genes. But we didn't know what happened when it did. So if the heat shock factor binds to the egdysone inducible genes, does it activate development or does it repress development? And that was the question that I had to answer in my project. We decided to use a new tool that was, it was new back then in 2017. It was called the CRISPR-Cas system. It's basically a gene editing system where you can manipulate genes within the organism with, with really good precision and accuracy. So I was basically using this Cas protein as a pair of molecular scissors to remove the binding sites for the heat shock factor. And in doing so, I could find out what the role of the heat shock factor was during the development of a fruit fly. So this was pretty cool. I finally got to use the knowledge that I was learning in class about genes and genetics and put it into, work, into practice within the lab. And while this started off as a summer project, I ended up committing to it for a thesis project. So I actually spent around a year and a half on this project. While this was all happening, I ran into this organization called STEM Fellowship. And what really interested me about this organization was that it had an initiative called the STEM Fellowship Journal. What they basically did was, this is a student-run journal, and it publishes research from high school and undergraduate students. So it's led by students for the students. And I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that this was a chance where I could use my science skills, everything I had learned during research, along with my non-science skills like the writing and editing I had learned from being at my campus newspaper. So I ended up applying, and I did actually manage to join the editorial board. So my role here was that when student researchers would write their manuscripts and send it into our journal, I would be paired with one of them, and I would work with them to improve their manuscript. So yes, that involved editing for simple things like grammar and spelling, but also when going, it also involved going above and beyond. For example, students may have missed an experiment or analyzed their data wrong or perhaps they did not cover as much as they should have in their paper. So these were the sort of problems I worked with students on. And the thing about scientific research is it's not just any manuscript that can be published. It actually has to be vetted by someone in the scientific community. So we would reach out to professional scientists and we would ask them to review these student manuscripts and, uh, and let, them know, let us know whether is this a novel finding that deserves to be published and shared with the community? So I would help mentor students in this stage. And in the end, if they were successful and if things did work out, we would end up sharing the student research with the world. So this was a really cool initiative. I found that I was finally doing science outside the lab and it was really cool. And it made me go back to my own research and I asked the question, how can I share my research with the world? I can't publish a paper because I'm still doing my project. I don't have data at this point. So perhaps there's something else I could try. So I ended up trying for a three-minute thesis competition. Now, the whole idea behind this competition is that you have to explain your research in three minutes or less. And this is to an audience who may not know science at all, so sort of like today, potentially. And I ended up using that same slide I showed you earlier to explain my research. And I actually did end up winning, so that was pretty cool. I also went to another conference to share my research. Now at this point you may be wondering, okay Farah, this is really cool, but I need to know the answer to this question. What does the heat shock factor really do? And the answer is, I can't tell you because I did not end up finding the answer to the question. So science is slow, it takes time. You may be doing an experiment for six months and it just doesn't work and you have to try again or you have to change a chemical you're using or you have to change the time point. So these are things that you have to keep in mind when you hear someone talking about research. So in my case, um, the CRISPR-Cas system was really new and we were still tweaking it around to work out what worked best. So when I actually left the lab, the project was not complete but we had an experimental plan in place. And that project is actually being led today by Jahan. So if you are interested in knowing the answer, maybe follow up with her in a few months because right now, as I said, science does take time. So at this point, I was wondering about the future. I knew that I liked research and I was more geared towards genetics, but I didn't know exactly 
whether I wanted to go to graduate school. I knew that to be a scientist, I had to work on my technical skills. And that meant joining a lab, working on perhaps a master's or PhD. But I didn't know if I was suited to lifestyle. I didn't want to be locked away in a lab 24-7 and just work hard, never seeing the light of day. I didn't entirely know what I was getting into. So at this point, my friend Olivia, who's actually the photo editor, again at my campus newspaper, she introduced me to Sasha Waditch, who is a PhD student on campus. And what was cool about Sasha, aside from her research, which is pretty cool, was that Sasha runs an Instagram page. And it's not full of pictures of coffee or aesthetic walls. It's actually her science life in action. It's not all the experiments that work out. It's also the experiments that fail. It's what she actually does in the lab all day. And it's what she does outside of the lab. So Sasha and a lot of other people in the science community, they showed me that they're not just stuck in the lab all day. They're going to conferences to share their research. They're doing science outreach to speak to the public and young students to share what they're actually doing in the lab. And this really helped me make a decision. I was like, okay, clearly they're not in the lab all day and there's more to science than just doing your research. So with this in mind, I decided that yes, I think I do want to commit to graduate school. So I sent in my graduate school applications. I had actually applied to three different departments and well, I didn't know entirely what I was looking for. I knew I wanted a project that involved genetics and preferably in a human setting so I could feel like it would translate over to humans. But because I wasn't sure of what I was doing, I ended up committing to the molecular genetics department. The really cool thing about this department is that you actually get to rotate through three different labs. So you get to be in a different lab for one month each. You find out whether you can work with the lab members, if you like the research, if the professor's personality works with you. And so I really like that opportunity. In my first lab, I was looking at Legionella. Legionella is, Legionella pneumophila is a bacteria which causes the fatal Legionnaire's disease. There's no known cure for it. So in this lab, they were focused on working out how Legionella worked. And if we have a better idea of how the systems in the bacteria work, we can work towards a cure for the Legionnaire's disease. So that was pretty cool. Another lab that I uh, was rotating in was developing organoids or mini organs to model disease. The specific graduate student I was being mentored by was creating a mini brain model to model brain cancer. So again, that was still really cool. Both options were great. Then I came across this lab where they were looking at DNA in humans, specifically looking at the genetic code of patients who were diagnosed with neurological disorders and trying to work out which mutations are disease causing. So I feel like we've sort of understood me at this point. I know that I like genetics, and I know that I want something in humans. So I ended up picking the DNA sequencing project. I picked it because I liked the research, and I picked it because I also liked the people. So the professor in this lab is called Dr. Ryan Yuan. I really liked his personality, and I felt like we worked well together. Anita Yin here is our statistical analyst, and Emma Butcher here is our research coordinator. She also recruits the patients for our lab. And the thing about joining a lab is, it's not just about whether you will fit in the lab, it's also about whether the lab likes you. That's something to keep in mind before you join a lab. So I ended up joining the Yen Lab, and I was working on this project. And what this project involves today, which I've been part of for about two months, is firstly, we start off by recruiting patients of interest. My specific project involves people with autism and epilepsy. So once we recruit patients of interest, we ask them to submit a DNA sample. This could be something like blood or plasma, or I think those are the only two options, but yeah. The first thing we do is patient de-identification. So at this point, none of their personal information will be released. So something like their name, their address, uh, where they live, all of that information is blocked and only our research coordinator knows that because she's recruiting the patients. After patient de-identification, we extract their DNA and then we send it in for sequencing so that we can work out all of the different bases that form their DNA. So we're work trying to work out their genetic code. We build an entire patient genome so that we know what their entire genetic code is. And we end up comparing it to a normal genome because we're trying to work out at what places is the patient genome different from a normal genome? Because these are the ones that could be disease-causing mutations. Now, the thing about comparing a patient genome to a reference genome is there are a lot of differences. As I said, humans are unique, and 
we are unique because of the changes in our genetic code. So it's hard to work out which ones are disease-causing and which ones are just regular mutations. So this is where I come in. I look at these individual mutations and I try to narrow them down to work out what is disease-causing. For example, if the patient was sequenced along with their family, and if their parents were, for example, unaffected, that that means if the patient has a mutation and that mutation is not in their parents, then it's more likely that it's disease-causing. Another thing that I keep in mind is that is this a gene with a mutation and this gene has previously been involved with this disease or are there any previous experiments that show that this mutation is pathogenic, it causes disease? So these are the sort of things I keep in mind as I analyze these mutations and this is called variant interpretation. And at the end, I'm trying to identify disease risk genes. Now at this point, if I find a disease risk genes, I can't just hand it off to a doctor and say, hey, this is the end. If you ever find a patient with this gene, then that's it. You know which disease it is. That's not true. You have to be thorough if you ever want your data to be used in a clinical setting. So once I do identify disease risk genes, I have to validate it. For example, in my case, I would use human cell lines and I would engineer the mutation into the cell line to see, is the same disease symptoms showing up? Is this replicable? Will it show up in a number of diff different cell lines? So I have to be really sure that it is actually causing disease. And is it present in other patients, current or future? Or is it just a common mutation that you find in a lot of different people? So there is a bit more work to do before these disease risk genes can be used in a clinical setting. So that's sort of where I am today. I do DNA sequencing of patients diagnosed with neurological disorders, and I've been doing it for about two months. And I find it really fun. And the thing about my project is that it's a mix of, being, of doing both experiments and not doing experiments. So I can work from home on some days where I don't want to go in and I don't have to wear a lab coat if I don't want to. But on the days I'm doing experiments, then yes, I absolutely have to wear gloves and lab coats and be very careful as I deal with DNA samples. And on the side, I've continued to write. For example, as Kirsten mentioned earlier, I write for Science Borealis, which is a Canadian science blog network. And for example, I recently covered a Canadian woman in STEM conference, which is focused on how do we keep women in science. I also volunteer with SciComTO, which is a, it's a group of people who are nerdy about science, and they simply want to share it with the people around them. So we host events, for example, science talks, or we focus on popular culture, for example, the science of Stranger Things. If you are a Stranger Things fan, you'll know that that's Demogorgon, and that is a really lifelike uh, costume. Another thing that we do are SciCraft workshops. For example, this specific workshop focused on knitting women in science ornaments, and there were beginners and experts, and everyone managed to walk away with a semi-looking head that looked like a woman in science. And yeah, so that is sort of where I am today, which makes me come back to the question I asked you guys in the beginning. What does it mean to be a scientist? Well, if we return back to this picture, firstly, a scientist, it's not just one person. It takes quite a few people to get research done. And you're definitely not the only person who helps you make it to this point. For example, in my case, it literally took a village. It took my family, who obviously provided me with the safety and the security and the comfort to let me explore my science interests and my non-science interests. It takes the institutions, for example, my high school and my undergraduate degree that helped me build the science foundation to even understand what I'm doing today. It involves the professors who took me on the project when they could have picked anyone else, and they helped me build my science skills, lab skills, and just thinking about science. It's obviously included my friends who have listened to me ramble on about research or when I get stuck on a problem and offer their thoughts. It obviously involves the different organizations I've volunteered with because they've offered me the chance to do science beyond the lab. And it, obviously, it also involves the people who have shared their stories because it really helps to see what an actual scientist looks like. And then we return here to the mad scientist picture. Now, this person, it looks like they're clearly driven by science, which is great. Some people know exactly what they want to do in research and they go straight for it, which is awesome. But for others, we don't know what we're interested in research. And for me, it was my non-science interest that actually helped me find myself where I am today. It took writing, 
for two different organizations, volunteering or just trying out different research projects to understand what I was interested in research. And here we have a picture of the scientists in lab coats. And it makes it, it, makes it look like that scientists are always in the lab, and that's not true. Science is more than just the lab. It's when I'm a scientist when I go to a conference and present my research. I'm a scientist when I'm writing for a paper because I'm using my scientific thinking. I'm a scientist when I'm perhaps um, at an event and just simply helping out. So I want to flip the question back to you guys. So how can you be a scientist? Whether you're a current high school student or an undergraduate or simply a concerned citizen, there is a place for science for you too. For example, if you're a current student, then you can apply to experiential science programs. For example, there's SHAD every summer. There's GEM, which is a girls' e-mentorship program where you can be paired with a female woman in science who will actually mentor you to find science uh, positions or any positions you're really interested in. There is Gene Researcher for a Week, where you can actually go during your March break and do genetic research for a week and see what it's all about you can take part in the citizen science project. For example, if you're someone who does bird watching and you head out every day at 5 a.m. to check out birds, you can actually record what you find online on eBird. And scientists will actually use that data to work out bird migrating patterns and see, hey, there are less American robins this year or there are more black-capped chickadees. So this data is actually really useful. There is practically a citizen science project for almost anything, for example, bird watching or butterfly watching or frogs, or if you're living up north, you can do an ice watch and help scientists work out, are the glaciers melting more than normal or less? You can take part in science outreach. So if you're perhaps currently an undergraduate student, there are things such as Let's Talk Science, STEM Fellowship, or Women in Science and Engineering, where you can share what you're doing with other people. There are science-themed events and weeks, such as Science Literacy Week, which is usually around September, and Science Odyssey, which is coming up in May. These are usually full of some fun science events. For example, they bring out microscopes, and you can look at red blood cells or white blood cells or bacteria and get a sense for yourself what they look like under a microscope lens. There is also simply the fact that you can use scientific thinking in every part of your life. You may have noticed the rise of fake news today, and the easiest way to combat it is simply to check your sources and do your own background research. Half of science is simply looking at papers and deciding for yourself what you want to do next. And you can always encourage and support your fellow scientists. And I think the biggest one of them all is that you can actively participate in the March for Science Toronto, which is happening on 14th April, which is open to scientists, concerned citizens, students, and everyone to really take to the streets and share why you believe science is important. And to wrap it up, I would like to thank everyone who's helped me reach where I am today, and of course, Royal Canadian Institute for Sciences, Kirsten and Kerry, who invited me to this event, and the Mississauga Central Library for hosting this talk. And yeah, thank you all for listening. <laughs>